Welcome back to Season 3 of 12 Days in March. In this video, we'll resume our discussion of renovascular hypertension for the USMLE Step 1 exam. As with all presentations, a PDF is available at the 12 Days in March website. Picking up the discussion, we covered malignant hypertension in our previous video. In this discussion, we'll shift our attention to arteriolar hyalinosis and the accompanying pathology of nephrosclerosis. And speaking of nephrosclerosis, that titillating topic is next in the queue, so grab your popcorn and root beer and let's get started. Let's start with the title, nephrosclerosis. That's easy. Nephro is kidney and sclerosis is scarring, so we have scarring of the kidney. Now I'm no genius, but I'm willing to bet that these little sclerotic vessels have something to do with this kidney scarring. Dang, I was right. Here it is. That arteriolosclerosis demonstrates a tiny lumen with evidence of hyaline deposits, referred to as hyalinosis. And that tiny lumen, over time, causes ischemia and scarring of the renal parenchyma. You need to be familiar with how that scarring will appear and how it will be described. Macroscopically, the shrunken kidney demonstrates a classic granular appearance. This is due to cortical scarring. On the inside, also referred to as the renal parenchyma, there is more scarring, but this isn't granular. Instead, it is described as the final common pathway in all states of chronic hypoperfusion. This description includes tubular atrophy, interstitial fibrosis, and glomerulosclerosis. All right. I lost my mind on that, but we just covered 90% of the topic, so let's get into the remaining gossip. What causes this condition? Most commonly, hypertension and diabetes. Check. We already mentioned there will be a reduction in mass and function, and that will be characterized by elevation of the creatinine or a decreased GFR. So we'll have long-standing hypertensive or diabetic with mild chronic kidney disease, and they'll ask you the basis for that finding. Answer, arteriolosclerosis or arteriolar hyalinosis, the terms are used interchangeably. Please note, in the clinic, this is a presumptive diagnosis as we don't biopsy these patients. And just so there is no confusion, the patient with nephrosclerosis will be readily distinguished from the patient with malignant hypertension on the basis of their indolent presentation. Likewise, the mild proteinuria, if present, will distinguish these patients from the proteinuric renal disease associated with nodular glomerulosclerosis. Insofar as pathogenesis, there are two parallel processes taking place. First, we see thickening of the intimal and medial layers in response to hemodynamic injury. As with other arteriopathies, the wall thickening results in narrowing of the lumen, which accounts for the development of parenchymal ischemia. Additionally, as a result of endothelial damage, we also see extravasation of proteins and deposition of extracellular matrix. In the diabetic, these extravasated proteins are referred to as advanced glycated end products. So these two changes, hyalinization and narrowing of the lumen, translate into the pathologic changes that are characteristic of this disorder. You should recognize that the hyalinization may be described as a homogeneous acellular thickening. And as already mentioned, the parenchymal changes are predictable and reflect nonspecific injury including atrophy, interstitial, and glomerular fibrosis. Macroscopically, the kidney will have a reduced sized, cortical scarring, and that classic granular appearance. Shown again is the nonspecific pathology associated with chronic vascular injury. There are a couple of important physiology derivatives buried into this topic, focusing on the efferent arteriole. But before proceeding, I did want to clarify the involvement of the afferent versus efferent arteriole in arteriolosclerosis. Generally speaking, hypertensive arteriolosclerosis is described as involving the afferent arteriole. The diabetic, on the other hand, is describing as involving either afferent or efferent arterioles. I make this distinction as we are about to travel down the road of filtration fraction, and some resources identify preferential efferent arterial involvement in diabetic hyalinosis. Whereas this is a useful concept for this discussion, it is not an invariable part of the condition. And with that said, let's catch up on the filtration fraction derivatives. To review, you will recall the formula for filtration fraction is the GFR divided by renal plasma flow. This is conceptualized by the artist's rendition of a glomerular tuft. 100% of the blood enters the glomerulus, but only 80% exits. 20% has been filtered. That is a normal filtration fraction. That's what a healthy kidney does, filters blood and makes urine. They love to do that. But what happens to the filtration fraction if you obstruct or constrict the efferent arteriole? 
This is a recurrent theme on step one. The two common examples you should be familiar with are hyalinosis in a diabetic and simply angiotensin II release. So what does happen to the filtration fraction? In this example, you can see that a lesion of the efferent arterial behaves essentially like a stricture. Renal plasma flow decreases due to limited flow past this functional stricture. Consequently, the intraglomerular pressure has to rise. The higher pressure and lower renal plasma flow result in an increased filtration fraction. Whereas this is useful in maintaining GFR, it is also the mechanism that results in hyperfiltration injury in diabetics and any patient with reduced renal function. So what would happen to filtration fraction if we relieve that obstruction through the administration of an ACE inhibitor? You have to be prepared to reason through this question and the associated physiology. Boom, take a look at this. We see the opposite effect. Lisinopril, the ACE inhibitor, is used and we get efferent arterial vasodilation as depicted. Renal plasma flow would increase due to the decreased vascular resistance while the intraglomerular pressure would decrease. The result will be a reduction in the filtration fraction. And this is exactly what we see with the use of ACE inhibitors. This is a key derivative. And whereas an ACE will reduce GFR, this is a desirable outcome. We are trading off that reduction in GFR in exchange for decreased glomerular pressures. And that is the magic. We are reducing hyperfiltration injury. This trade-off is beneficial in the long run. And that will do it for nephrosclerosis. We see hemodynamic injury leading to the deposition of extracellular matrix with or without advanced glycated end products in a diabetic. The arteriolar hyalinosis results in chronic ischemic injury to the kidney characterized by tubular atrophy with scarring of the glomeruli and interstitium and a reduction in renal mass. The key physiologic derivatives relate to increased resistance of the efferent arteriole, filtration fraction, and how this is impacted by ACE inhibitors. That's a mouthful for this very common clinical entity. Before departing from this presentation, let's pause and think about the other settings where you are likely to encounter hypertension or hypertension derivatives on the boards. This first example demonstrates the physiologic changes of diastolic dysfunction. These patients will be flagged as older hypertensives and you'll need to appreciate the association between diastolic heart failure and long-standing hypertension. This topic is reviewed elsewhere, but be familiar with the increased filling pressures required to maintain adequate cardiac output. The much more straightforward derivative will relate to the hypertensive patient presenting with an extra pre-systolic heart sound heard best at the apex. The derivative will likely ask you to identify the physiologic basis for the S4 as depicted in this graphic, but you can't diagnose the S4 without appreciating the underlying association with hypertension. And finally, they will use the hypertensive patient to introduce the usual treachery related to pharmacologic agents. This is a topic for a separate presentation. So these scenarios and materials on nephrosclerosis pretty much wrap up the curriculum for garden variety essential or primary hypertension as seen on step one. It is pretty straightforward once you consider the possibilities. So let's take a quick break and then resume our discussion of renovascular hypertension focusing on renal artery stenosis. Nice chatting with you today. Drop me a post if you have any questions or concerns.